Crystal, my wife only lets me dance in this box, right? So it's like, I can't fully express myself. For the best, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. John, how you doing, man? All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is it is 1130 and I am excited to see everybody that is here and there's going to be more people jumping on. They are just going to have to miss like the exciting parts that happen here in the very, very beginning. In fact, we're actually if I'm going to be very honest, we're stalling a little bit because our our, our surprise guest for today um, is actually he just called me and was like, hey, I'm having computer issues. And so he's trying to get on another computer. Um, so. You may have to like jump in with John at some point, but we are going to get this business meeting started. Happy May the 4th to all of you, right? Um, and so for those that it is May, right? Look at all the birthdays that we have between the Ranch Brokers Network, all the birthdays that we have in May. And so I'm not gonna read through all these names here, but hopefully you see your name, right? And just Happy birthday to you. Um, if you would like me to, at some point, I will sing a birthday song, but you probably don't want that, right? Um, hey, we are all about, and Keller Williams, it is all about our culture, right? It is all about our mission, vision, values, right? Our beliefs and our perspective. And so if you've never heard us say this, this is what our mission is. This is what we are about every single day. And that is to build careers worth having, businesses worth owning, lives worth living, experiences worth giving, and legacies worth leaving, right? Now, I don't know about you, but that is some incredible stuff, right? To be able to leave the legacies that we want to leave for our families, for, for our friends, that is very, very cool. Now, when it comes to our vision, what do we look at? We want to be the real estate company of choice for agents and their customers. We want to be everything that you want us to be, right? And we want to make sure that we're providing everything for you so that your clients turn to you in the most trusted times. And then, guys, probably the number one reason why I am here at Keller Williams is when I heard Gary Keller get up on stage one day and say, you know what? This is about God, family, and then it's about business. And that's our values. Now, you may look and go, hey, Bill, you know, it's not what I believe. Listen, we believe in you, right? no matter what. So, all right, and then our belief system. If you have never ever seen this, at some point, there is a dance that goes to this whole thing um, that we will demonstrate for you at some point. Um, but here is really truly, when we go into something, we wanna make sure that it lines up with who we are, which is the very first thing is win-win or there's no deal at all. It's gotta be beneficiary for you, for them, for you, for us. Otherwise, we don't have a deal on it. And in everything we do, we want to make sure that we have integrity, that internal honesty, that we always do the right thing. And then we have our four C's, right? Our Y four C's, two T's, right? Here's the thing. Customers will always come first. And we see this in every business, but customers will always come first. It's about doing that. And it's about being committed in everything that we do. So wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, we are in that moment. Now, Maybe you guys have seen communication be a struggle for a lot of different people, especially in today's world, right? We're busy accusing other people all the time of other things. And where we really need to come from is seeking first to understand, asking questions. Because man, growth will come when we ask the questions and we try to work to understand. And then always creativity, ideas before results, right? We will work together to make sure that we have the ideas that get the results that we want. And what we know is that teamwork is incredibly important because we can never do things the best on our own. But together through, you know, through everyone, we will always achieve more. And then of course, trust. It always starts with honesty. And so what we always ask is to always be honest. Even if it hurts, be honest. And then I love this one. This is one that we adopted last year as a, as a company. And that is equity, opportunities for all, that everyone should have the, the fair share and their right 
okay, and have the opportunity to be successful. And then of course, success, results through people. We always believe that the more successful we are, the better it is for everyone around us. And we wanna achieve those results through everybody. Now, what is our perspective? Well, we are a technology company that provides the real estate platform that our agents, buyers, and sellers prefer. We have the platform there in command and in your KW app. And Kelly Williams thinks like a top producer. It acts like a trainer consultant, focuses all its activities on service, productivity, and profitability. These are our mission, vision, value, right? Beliefs and perspective. And we want to make sure that you know that these are the heart of everybody and everything that we are. And we really and truly want you to know these, okay? All right, moving on. When we come down to our belief system, when we come down to trust, right? And integrity, I don't think there's anybody greater than Mr. John Hansen. And John, we have been, you and I have been talking about this, about the 22 AD, right? And what it's doing, I know that there's a lot of people frustrated right now with what's going on in the 22 AD, but maybe you can give us a little insight. What's going on? Yeah, happy to. Well, the first thing I want to mention about it is that I do, I do get very, very frequent questions about it. And when you get the questions, it's usually in sort of a panic voice. And there's no reason to be panicked about it. The 22 AD is, is pretty self-explanatory and it's, and it's really not as complicated as, we, as our minds try to make it think. So there's just two sections to it, uh, numbered one and two as you can see here. And, uh, and number one is used if you're using Form 22A, if there is a financing contingency. Okay, so it is possible, right, that, that your buyer could be getting financing but not making it contingent, not making the deal contingent on financing. In that case, and you were gonna use the 22AD, you would use paragraph two here and you would check that box for paragraph two, which means that it's gonna be conditioned on getting an appraisal that comes in, but you know, with, which is the 22 AA, uh, condition on the appraisal coming in, good, but that is not going to be conditioned on getting financing, right? And so we wanna be careful to make sure we, we are not being deceptive when we're representing the buyer and the buyer is getting a loan to not disclose that, okay? We have a duty, license law duty, defined by the Department of Licensing to always disclose a source of funds. And I wanna make it real clear that, that every offer that is made by a buyer is deemed to be cash, always deemed to be a cash purchase unless otherwise uh, delineated, which we do with our 22A financing addendum, right? So, so there's no such thing as waiving financing when financing never existed. Mm. So if financing existed with Form 22A, and then at some point the buyer wants to waive that financing conting contingency that they made, then they can do that waiver, right? And there's several situations, obviously, that that would come into play. But when we're talking about an offer, there's no waiver of the financing condition. It's not an automatic thing that's there. We would have to put in the 22A to make it conditioned on financing in order to waive that financing. So, so in other words, you're saying you can't waive something that doesn't exist. Correct. So you have to have a 22A which is a contingency, has to be in the offer, and then at that point, you can waive it. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Because otherwise, it's just deemed to be a, ca deemed to be a cash purchase anyway. Right. So if there's okay. going to be a loan of some kind, which we're getting a lot of in this market, but it's not conditioned on that loan, that needs to be disclosed somewhere, right? And, and 22AA is a good place to do it if you're going to use the 22AD also, because that way these, the, these two things in number two kind of go in tandem. Um, so in each of the areas of one and two, you're going to indicate how much ab above 
uh, the down payment. See, AD stands for additional down payment. Keep that in mind. I mean, that's where the confusion gets taken away for me when I think that the 22 AD stands for additional down payment. Right. Okay. And so that, that's how much additional down payment the buyer is willing to come up with in cash separately, right? Yeah. So I know, I know one of the questions that, that I get asked a lot, John, um, is, is people say, hey, well, if we make an offer, let's just use round numbers of 500000 and we have a $20,000 additional down payment, and the appraisal comes in at four ninety, so ten thousand dollars less. Does that mean that my buyers have to put all twenty thousand dollars down? And the answer to that is no, right? It is they would only be using ten thousand of their twenty thousand additional down to get to the purchase price. Correct. Correct. And and also we want to be really careful about one thing, and that is that. If in either one or two, in either situation, if um, if we have a situation where the appraisal is actually low enough that it uses up that twenty thousand dollars you just mentioned, Bill. Yeah. Uses that up, and it's still we're still short another five thousand. Let's say. So it came in twenty five thousand low. Yeah. So so now. The danger is that if you send the notice um, to the seller with the notice of low appraisal with the 22 AD uh -huh, notice of low appraisal, right? Then what can happen is that the seller has the option to terminate the contract. Mm -hmm. They can either reduce it, the price, or they can terminate the contract, one or the other. Right. And so if your buyer doesn't want to get the deal terminated on them and they and they and they're thinking, well, that five thousand extra, you know, maybe we can get that from Uncle Louie, you know, and he'll forward me that five thousand and we can we can just pay the difference. Then what the buyer's gonna to want to do is waive their financing. Okay. At that point, because then yeah. the seller, if the buyer waives the financing, the seller can't terminate. You'll notice in the 22 AD that in both the situations, if it does what I just said, it says that the buyer shall deliver the notice to the seller. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say they have a choice, it says they shall do it. Mm -hmm. The notice of that low appraisal. And so in order to make sure that doesn't happen, the buyer can just waive financing and be done. Perfect. John, would they deliver the notice of low appraisal and the waiver of financing at the same time? Um, yeah, I think that would be fine. Okay. So they would have to do, they would have to, they would still deliver the notice of low appraisal, but you would also have to deliver a waiver of financing if you want to continue the contract. Yeah, I would just waive the financing but okay. myself, but yeah. it's okay if they want to also okay. Perfect. notify them of low appraisal, that's fine too, I guess. But I would just simply waive the financing. To continue. Awesome. So John, what about an agent that calls up this, the selling agent, the listing agent and says, hey, we've got a, the appraisal came in 25 low, our AD only covers 20,000. Do you think your, your seller would lower the price by five grand to put the, keep this deal together and get a feel for it before you send the notice? Would that give them the right? They couldn't just walk by knowing that. They can only walk after notification and writing, right? Yeah, but a lot of things could happen, you know, so... You can they could say yes and then not do it. Right. Okay. They could. Yeah. I mean, we, and we've seen, we've seen buyers and sellers change their mind at the last minute, verbally say something and then not come through. Yes. Right. Um, you know, Morgan Eisenberg had a question, you know, what are, and I'm going to pull it back up here because I just, I had it in my head and then I had a dentist moment, right? <laughs> what negative effects could happen to buyers if you waive financing? Well, it depends on what the default provision uh, paragraph eight of the purchase and sale agreement says, whether it's going to be a default of earnest money only or buyer or seller's election of remedies. And so if it's default of earnest money only, then the earnest money is on the line. Yeah. Then it's the, then it's the, a waiver of financing, right? Really and truly is what jeopardizes the, the earnest money. So if, if there's no other contingencies in there to get it back. 
Yeah, and keep in mind, uh, and also keep in mind that uh, the um, with with the um, earnest money on the line, only on the line, that that is that is the exclusive and sole remedy that the seller would have. And if the seller does terminate the transaction because we send a notice of that low appraisal and they elect to terminate the transaction, um, then uh, the earnest money would be refunded to the, to the buyer. Yeah, to the buyer. Okay, so there's a yep. couple of strategic things to be thinking about and consulting with your buyer. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect, John. Are there any other questions for John? All right, all right. Okay, so no questions, John. John, thank you for being here. So again, if you ever have any questions when it comes to contracts, right, John is available by text or email, or you can email or text me, um, and we will get you the answer. I'm excited. Um, you know, one of the greatest things that that I've got to experience while being at Keller Williams is is having a mentor like Dennis, who is who is literally, literally, you know, is like Bill. Let's talk about building your wealth. Right, because I never had those talks with my dad growing up. I never had that mindset that wealth was something that I could necessarily accumulate. I just wanted to live a good life, right? And Dennis has really challenged me, and and I wanted to to have a conversation with Dennis today because I think it's one of the most beneficial things that you can have is having a conversation about building wealth, right, and what it means to us. Now, Dennis, maybe you can give us a little bit. I wouldn't necessarily say, well, let me ask you this question. Have you always been wealthy? I mean, you own, you own, you know, you really, you and your wife own three market centers plus some business centers, right? Have you always been wealthy? Nope. Okay. Very simple answer. So what yeah. was life like 12 years ago? What was 12? What year was that? <laughs> uh, that's going to be 2009, I believe. Oh, geez. Well, let's go back to 2008 when the market fell apart. We were just okay. starting out. Um, our kids had just graduated college, which meant guess who had the student debt loans? That was you me because I didn't yeah. save money for student. You know, I didn't, number one, I didn't go to college. So who thinks that far in advance, right? Right. Who thinks their kids are going to go? You want them to go, but then when it's time to go, you haven't saved money for it. So you have to, you have to get a, what they call a FAFSA loan. And the FAFSA loan is very interesting. It's the kid that fills out the FAFSA loan and only to find out they don't qualify for squat and the parent has to put up most of the money through the FAFSA loan. So they're basically guaranteeing that loan. So at that time, the kids had just graduated, two of them out of WSU. And uh, we had 80,000 in student loans. Um, wow. <clears throat> and I think we had, oh man, I don't remember what else we had, but it was over $100,000 in debt. We had, a, we had a house. We had one house, the house we yeah. were living in, um, which actually we're upside down on that too because we bought in 07. Wow. Yeah, okay. we bought in 07. Uh, we paid $730,000 for it. Yeah. And it was probably at that time, it was probably worth five hundred. dollars know, so, okay. in 09. Yeah, it dropped that much. That's, that's you know, we don't, we don't even think about that, right? But so... You, you owed more money on your house than what it was worth. You're over $100,000 in debt. And this is 12, 13 years ago. And so what was it What was it that changed in you to go, this isn't where I want to be? Well, I don't know that anything really changed in me. I, I've always known that, that building wealth is always mindset first. You know, what do you, what do you mean believe by that? about yourself? What do you believe about yourself? Okay. I mean, what do you believe about money? I mean, people have all kinds of twisted ideas about what money is. Some people think it's evil. Some people think it's, it's you know, right? You've heard that's the root of all evil. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. well, let, let, let me, let me, as the pastor, let me come out here, right? So, because people misquote this all the time, they say money is the root of all evil. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible literally says the love of money is the root of all evil. So, right. when you prioritize it up here, right, and it becomes your love language or your love, that's when we run into issues. Yeah. And I think uh, back then, Dave Ramsey was just coming out with his Financial Peace University, yeah. maybe okay. a little bit before that. So we, we definitely took that class and just to say, you know, we need to get completely out of debt because as long as you're in debt, you don't have opportunity. Okay. And when you're out of debt and you can have some reserves, now opportunity, num number one, opportunity shows up always. 
it might not seem like it when you're in debt. And even if it showed up, it wouldn't matter because you don't have anything to take advantage of it. Right. See what I'm saying? So number one, that's your number one thing. Get out of debt. And that's probably the, it's probably the most difficult part of the journey of trying to build wealth. It is, because right? People, people don't have, they, they, what they did is they bought things they couldn't afford on, on a timeline that now by the time they get it paid off, it's junk. Let's take your car, for example. Yeah. Right? Yep. Uh, you might do a six-year loan in your car. Well, six years later, you got 150000 on it because you're showing houses all over the place. And it's, it's basically, it's worth nothing. Now you got to go start all over again. And you haven't had a chance to save any money because you've been paying these monthly payments. So for those, for those that are looking to build wealth, right, to... Let's just start from the beginning, right? What I hear you saying is, hey, let's get out of debt. What's the step? Once we get out of debt, what's the step? Now, first of all, let me ask, and I'm asking the wrong question. How do we start to get out of debt? Well, I like Dave Ramsey's philosophy of taking your smallest loan first and, and selling whatever you have to sell and putting, maybe working overtime, doing some extra things to make extra money. And pay that, pay that little one off first and then take that amount, whatever that amount is that you were paying on and put it towards the next smallest loan. So you have more, mm-hmm. if you have multiple loans, you just want to get those suckers paid off as quick as you can. So you, the snowball you don't realize how quick you pay them off when you're paying an extra couple hundred dollars a month on a payment. Yeah. You yeah. Know, if your payment's 400 bucks and you pay an extra 200, it's, it's going to pay it off way faster than you think it will. That's amazing. So, okay. So get out of debt, pay things off quicker. What's the, what should we be investing in when, when we're out of debt? What's so if I was, if I was just starting out, number yeah. one, I build up my reserves after I'm out of debt so that I have, I don't have to go back to a credit card if something happens. Okay. How much reserves should we build up? I think Dave Ramsey says six months. Okay. Um, that's might make seem like a lot to a lot of people, but um, if you've been used to making credit card payments or how, car payments or whatever, it's not that much. You can actually do that pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and I would agree with that. I, I'd rather have a year's worth just because there's more opportunity when you have a year's worth of savings um, put aside. And you, number two, you don't, you never panic about what's happening, especially in real estate. I mean, you can get, you can get pretty uptight when things aren't closing and you need yeah. that money, right? Okay. Okay. So Troy had a question. For you real quick. I see some questions are coming yeah. up on the chat board, but I'm, I'm not trying to read those. So no, that's okay. So I, and I'll ask them here though, but, but Troy had a question about, you know, when you're getting out of debt, does that include your primary home as well? Nope. Okay. It doesn't. So, Dave, so getting out of debt doesn't mean that you still have a mortgage. I still have a mortgage. Perfect. And okay. I, and I also have mortgages on rental properties and I won't pay those off. I might pay extra towards them, but I, I'm not in a hurry to pay those off because the, the, the tenants are paying your rent or sorry, your mortgage for you. So perfect. Okay. And, and Sarah had a question. What was your number in savings? Just one year's worth? I like a year's worth of reserves. Yeah. And yeah. that's personally and business wise. So it's a year, it's a year reserves for business and a year reserves for personal. Yes, but by the time by the time you have even six months on on both sides of that, you can start looking for opportunities. Well, and, and opportunities, was, as you said, will present themselves. I mean, they will you present really, themselves. Really want, you won't have to look for it. Yes, um, and I would, here's the other part of it: when you're doing well in real estate, you're paying a lot of money in taxes. Yeah, and that's yeah. your biggest. It's your biggest debt. It is. So number one, stay in front of that. It's okay. the biggest. Would you say it's the number one mistake all most real estate agents make? It was for me. Yeah, it was for me too. Right? It took me seven years to figure out how to get ahead of it. Yep. That's a long time. That's a, that's what you call a slow learner. <laughs> Dennis beats this stuff into me all the time, so it's good. So yeah. Okay. So then what I do is I if it was me and I'm I'm trying to build wealth, I'd start contributing to my my uh, IRAs and max those suckers out. Okay. And the reason I do that now is I still do it now is because um, whatever you put towards it, you don't have to pay in taxes. So in other words, let's say uh, you're at the max tax bracket of 37%. Okay. 
and you're going to put $10,000 in the IRA. Well, where do you think 37% of that's going to come from? It's coming from the IRS because otherwise you can pay the IRS that $3,700. Yeah. So why not invest in that? They're, they're basically begging you to invest and it only helps you out, especially over a long haul. Would you recommend doing, I mean, because there's, there's two different types of IRAs, right? Would you yeah. recommend doing a Roth IRA or just a- Talk, to your, talk to your accountant. It okay. depends on if you think you're going to have more money when you retire or less money when you retire. Okay, perfect. Because one charges taxes after one charges taxes before. Correct. Okay. And you might do both. You might do a combination. Okay, perfect. I talk and to your true- accountant. Troy had a question about reserves, going back to the reserves real quick. Where do you suggest keeping those reserves? In a bank account, a low risk fund? Yeah, you you could do a little mutual fund, something that is um, very liquid so you can get to it if you need it. Okay. No penalty. That's that's what reserves are there for, right? They're they're the funds to, you got it. If you tie it up in something, you can't liquidate it. That's right. Okay. Well, you could, but it's probably going to cost you money. Okay. Okay. Dennis, I think, I think, you know, cause we can go on forever on this, on this subject, right? Talk to me as somebody who has built wealth, somebody who you have a goal of making millionaires out of our agents, right? Yeah. Because you've watched what you've gone through and where you've come to, and you want to see people, you want to see people live a better life. Bill, I've been, been selling real estate since I was 28 years old. Yeah, that was a long time I'm ago. No longer 28, believe it or not. So. That was a long, long time ago. So I just turned 62 yes. uh, a couple of days ago. And what I've seen over the years is I've watched the older agents. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them don't plan or, yeah. or they, they never really made enough money to, to have other opportunities. And they end up retiring on Social Security. And it's just not right. It is not what you want. You guys, I cannot, if, if you can't hear it in Dennis's voice, I have literally, and I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, Dennis, I apologize, but I've literally watched Dennis shed tears when it comes to agents and their circumstances because he cares that much. It is his life's mission for you to live a better life, a bigger life than what you have now, not only while you're working with Keller Williams, but for your future and what you leave behind in your family. If you want to see Dennis really shed tears, right? It's he has set himself up to be where he is today so that his, when he no longer is here, that his family is taken care of and secure. And, and you don't have those doubts today, correct? Right. And, and the funny thing is, Bill, is I thought, I thought my dad was wealthy. I didn't, had no idea. Yeah. He died. He had nothing. He didn't even own a house. He lived with his, his wife who owned the house mm. and he had a piece of property in Auburn um, that luckily was pending at the time he died and we got, we got closed. And at the end of that, he owned this property for 40 years and it was 40 acres. Yeah. He owned it for 40 years. He had a partner with him. And by the, by the time it was all said and done, each kid got about $56,000. There was four kids. Wow. So that, well, that's a lot of money. Yeah. It's not going to change your life. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's, it's very temporary. It was great. And I'm, I was grateful for it, but it's, it's not what I'm talking about. That's not building wealth. That's just something that he happened to have held on to for all those years. Yeah. yeah. What would you say? I think the last question, what's the biggest mistake that you've learned from? <laughs> when I was in my thirties, um, when I was in my thirties, I had an IRA. I had started an IRA. And I think I had like $30,000 saved up and somebody from my church had this, this amazing opportunity to um, get a 4% return per month. And, and you could roll your IRA into it. So I thought, well, it must be safe because you, you know, the government is, is, is um, protecting it. So you, you don't have to pull it out of your IRA. You're basically, you're rolling it over into this investment uh, vehicle that he had. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, Put, first I did, I put 15,000 in, half, half of what I had saved up, my life savings, right? Yeah. 15,000 into this thing and it started paying 4%. I get this statement every month of 4% return, 4% return. After a year, I said, you know what? I want to put the rest in there because it's, it's really starting to build up. 
And then about six months later, it, it, the statements quit showing up. It was a Ponzi scheme. I lost it all. So I was trying to, I was trying to build, build wealth too fast with, with a vehicle I didn't know enough about. Okay. So I would say, you know, make sure that whoever you're dealing with is, is very, number one, understand what it is you're, you're investing in. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully if you're in real estate, you understand real estate. That's not a cheap investment to make. You've got to have a lot of money to be able to buy a rental property, mm -hmm. right? 20, yeah. 25% down, whatever the number is. Um, it takes a lot of savings to be able to do that. So I do like real estate as an investment, but I also think the stock market's fine too. Yeah. It's, it's treated us very, very well, especially over the last 10 years. Yes, there's ups and downs, but the, the, key to, the key to that is you don't even look at that. You just, look, I'm, for me, I don't have to take anything out of the stock market until I'm 70 and a half. There so I'm not going to be touching it for at least 10, almost 10 more years. Yeah. Yeah, right. which is so, and, and, and it's a long game. It is. It's, it's not game. if it drops by two thousand points tomorrow, I'm going to probably be buying in because I've right. got you know eight and a half, nine more years. Yeah, I in fact I remember when when we first went in the pandemic and the stock market was taking some hits. Dennis and I shared an office, right? And Dennis is like, "I'm buying, I'm buying." He's like, "Bill, what are you buying?" And I look at Dennis and I'm like, "I bought two shares of Disney stock." <laughs> you know, it's like, but my Disney stock, by the way, is up. You know, so there you go. Well, here's another mistake people make is trying to pick stocks. Don't do that. Yeah. Even though you love Disney and you're all about Disneyland, yeah. don't try to pick a stock. Buy yeah. index funds. It's the smartest thing you could do. There you go. There you go. Well, Dennis, uh, just thank you for your time. I know you can go on this forever, guys. If you ever, Dennis's whole mission really and truly is, is to get you to where you are to, so that you're able to build wealth and leave a legacy for your family and live the lifestyle that you guys want to live a bigger life than what you have now. Right. Dennis is there to, to show you how to do your P and L's, how to really and truly know your numbers and how to get money to work for you. Make sure when he teaches agent financials, you're in that class. I mean, this is somebody who passionately cares about you. And I, and I, I cannot, I am so grateful that for the last year, I got to see, you know, at least six months of it, I got to be in the same office as him because I, I listened, I got privy to more phone calls and understanding things that I was like, huh, and it would make me think. So Dennis, thank you for your time and uh, just for sharing, for sharing your heart. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Hey, just so everyone knows that's out there, if they're interested and they want to track their wealth, I do have a nice net worth tracker that I'd be happy to send to anybody that is interested. Perfect. Just, email, just email me, Dennis Ranch at kw.com. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. I appreciate it, my friend. Okay. All right. Moving on because we are running out of time here real quick. So um, next slide, Goldie, if you can for me. Guys, we have got um, Red Day coming up. Make sure you check with your market centers. That'll be an exciting day. That's next Thursday, the 13th. Okay. And uh, so you'll see the different events going on there for, the, for our different locations. But I want to turn it over to Ms. Crystal LaPron right now. And Crystal, it is Tech Corner, right? Tech Moment, what do you got for us? Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, I am going to talk to you about some new and exciting things with smart plans. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Um, if you have spent any time in a one-on-one -on -one with me, you have heard about my love of smart plans. Um, I recognize a lot of names here, so I've talked to a lot of you. Uh, I'm here in the smart plans library and wanted to point out a few things. Um, one, the Northwest region has been working on some smart plans, particularly for you. Uh, you can search them by typing in Northwest or NW region here in the search bar, but they all happen to be on the top rated smart plans right now. So you can actually just scroll down to top rated and you can check out these Northwest region smart plans on page one and page two. Uh, if you are using them and you like them, we would love a five-star rating. That would be lovely, especially on this first-time home buyer smart plan, which is the one that I wrote for you. So these are based solely on um, feedback that I'm getting from agents saying, like, what are the smart plans that you want and need? We know that building your own can be pretty daunting. Um, and that the smart plans library is a bit of the wild, wild west. So we wanted to make sure that there are smart plans that work for you the way that you want them. Um, the newest one that I uploaded right before this meeting is this open house follow-up smart plan. Uh, this is based on several meetings that I had with several of you. Um, I wrote this one, so I made it what you all told me you wanted it to be. 
And I am going to go ahead and add it to my library because I want to show you something really exciting with smart plans uh, that is great in and of itself, but is also uh, a precursor to some really exciting things. So I am going to hop over to my smart plans. Please ignore my library. It is a giant mess of teaching things. And I'm going to go ahead and hit the edit button on this smart plan. Uh, best practice, don't ever start anybody on a smart plan that you haven't read all the contents of. Agents do it all the time. I get angry text messages sending, saying, hey, someone got a text message with somebody else's information in it. Um, and nine times out of 10, it's because someone didn't read a smart plan. So always check out your smart plans. Uh, this one is full of text messages and emails and tasks to make phone calls and things like that to help you follow up on open houses. But what I want to show you today is this add a trigger event button. Once you have a smart plan in your library, you can actually add what's called a tag trigger. And if I add a tag trigger to this smart plan and I, I all of my trigger tags start with the word trigger. Um, the reason being is I want to remember that when I use that tag for something, it triggers something to happen. Something's going to happen anytime I use that tag. What that means now is because I've said trigger for this particular smart plan is open house, or because this open house smart plan has a trigger, anytime I tag anybody in my database with this tag, it will automatically start that smart plan. So I don't have to go into the library and pick the smart plan and add them to it. If I had 10 leads that came in from an open house, right? And we were using a digital sign-in because I'm sure we're all doing that. So they did a digital sign-in, the lead came straight into your command. And now you've got these 10 people who attended your open house. You can bulk tag all of those people with this tag and it will automatically start that smart plan. This is great in and of itself. It makes adding people to smart plans much easier. But what is so great about getting these systems set up now is that this is the precursor to automatic tagging. And what I mean is, is eventually when you have a lead come in in the system, you can tell the system when that lead comes in, automatically tag it with this tag. And then you can tell that tag to automatically start a smart plan. That means if you have a Facebook lead coming in, you can say, hey, Facebook, when that lead comes in, automatically tag it with this tag. And then you can tell that tag to automatically start a smart plan. And that person is getting emails and text messages from you before you even know that they're in the system. Uh, so it is going to save you so much time and so much energy. Uh, the precursor to that is setting up these tag triggers on your smart plans. So it is a great idea to go ahead and get in that habit now. It makes it a lot easier for you to get going on your communication. And they work beautifully. In fact, Chris and I sat down, we did one this last week, right, for, for a listing that I had for a friend. And uh, literally the leads that were coming through, it was just, it was so simple because from my phone, I could put, you know, I could pull them up and just hit, you know, T and here came the trigger tag. I tagged them and off it went and stuff. And they were communicating back, which was amazing. So nice yeah. job, Crystal. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? I might have a question for you, Crystal. Okay, go for it. Um, so I, the last couple of weeks for open house, I've been using, um, a plan, or I've been doing electronic sign-in and a couple weekends ago it worked, um, all the leads came through. And then this last weekend, I went to check all the people, all their information um, <clears throat> that they inputted and none of them transferred over to my command. Well, that is not what I like to hear. <laughs> and so I don't, I don't, is there any tips that I did wrong or anything? That is the first I've heard of that being an issue. So I would love to take a look at it and see what happened. Cause that Cause was the previous week. So I don't know what, yeah, that's the first I've heard of that being an issue. So I definitely love to love to hop into your command and take a look. Kathy Jones has a question for you, Crystal. What program yeah. are you using for electronic sign-in? So if you want them to go straight into your command, mm -hmm. you are using a landing page with a lead capture form. Okay. Uh, and that I would love to show you how. We don't have time today, have but time today, uh, that's yeah. how I'm doing that. I'm using our consumer <laughs> applet. Um, and creating a page that has a lead capture form. And then when they're typing in their information, it's going straight into my command. That's awesome. It's guys, this system was created to bring ease to your business, right? I mean, that's what it's it's there for. It's to make you the better agent. So if you really truly haven't adopted command because you're like, well, it doesn't do this or it doesn't do that, 
it does so much more. Check it out today because what KWRI right now is they're on a 66 day challenge to stabilize the platform, not just going, hey, look what it does today. Look what this it literally is. They're stabilizing it to make sure that it works even better for each one of us. So thank you very much, Crystal, for your time. You are welcome. I'm putting my calendar link in the chat. So if you want to set up a one on one, if you've got more questions, let me know. Beautiful. Beautiful. Excellent. Well, we just have a couple more things real quick. Hey, don't forget, this was such a popular discussion uh, at you know, one of our previous business meetings that we are having off-market sales mastermind uh, next Wednesday from 11 to 1230. You want to make sure with, with all the off-market sales that are going on right now, you want to make sure that you are part of this. Okay. Um, so make sure that you register for the class and you can get there. Also, guys, if you own a home right now, right? If you own a home as a Keller Williams agent through June 20th right now, Keller Mortgage, your mortgage company is doing a refinancing special where you can get right lowest interest rates around. They're going to take another quarter percent off and get you the lowest rate when the rates were so incredibly low just a couple months ago. They're going back to that for all Keller Williams agents and your clients. So if you want a way to attract more clients, right? Talk to them because you are the fiduciary. You take care of all of your clients. Here's a great way, right? To just stay in contact with them and show them that you're always looking out for their best interest. And that's the 60 day Kellen mortgage refinancing special. Again, there are no monthly you know, fees. There's no lender fees. They order appraisal when you, know, when you submit your application, everything else is there. Okay. Um, in fact, if you, Crystal said, if you download the open house smart plan or any of our Northwest region starter plans, let me know, right? It says, let me know if you have any questions or any feedback. Okay. Now I know it says have a great day, but somewhere on this call, and I can't see her right now is Miss Rita Mendez. She was on this call a little bit earlier. I don't know if she's still there, um, but Rita is going to be doing, for those of you that know Rita, Rita is a, is a life coach, right? A transformational coach. And Rita is going to be doing for our office, having what we call a coach's corner. Just for you guys, laser focus, little 15 minute sessions. Her and I are working out exactly how to have that for you guys and make it work for you. But when you see Rita, she's always gonna be joining us on our, on our business meetings. And we're also gonna be setting up a business, co a business coaching corner or personal life coaching corner just for you because we care about you. Again, we want to treat the whole person and care about all of you. So are there any questions, anything that we covered or didn't cover that you would like information on? Joaquin, it is wonderful to see your face, my friend. So, okay. It's wonderful to see all of you. Listen, guys, have a wonderful, wonderful day. If you need anything, please feel free to call me or call Crystal or call you know Goldie or Dennis or whoever you wanna to talk to, all right? Listen, yeah, I was going to just come up with a total dad joke and I'm just, I'm going to let that one go. Anyways, love you guys. Have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you guys soon. Okay.